Pastor Sarah and I have been telling you stories about people encountering Jesus. So far, we've heard about Thomas. We've heard about Mary Magdalene. This morning, we are going to hear a story about a woman that doesn't get a name in the Bible. She's only known as the Samaritan woman at the well. She's defined by her ethnic identity, her geographic identity, but unlike Nicodemus, whose story happens in the chapter that just precedes this one, who gets his name and his, he's a Pharisee, he's important in all of these things, this seemingly unimportant woman has a profound encounter with Jesus. Her story is found in John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 42, so buckle in. It's a long story, but it's a good one. And as we read this together, listen for what the Word of God is saying to you in your lives, in your circumstances today, whatever they may be. Hear now the Word of the Lord. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? 
Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. John's gospel is filled with stories of people who don't understand. I can relate to them because there are a lot of things I don't understand either. Jesus is the master in John of cryptic speeches and answering questions with other questions. This is a story that is filled with misunderstanding. First off, I love this detail that Jesus has been in Judea, remember, and he's been with Nicodemus and he's been telling him about how God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have life everlasting. For God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. And that word world, well, it means... The world, everyone, everything in it. And now we have Jesus who, there's a rumor going around that Jesus has baptized more people than John. And so Jesus flees Judea to go back to Galilee. And, and well, John tells us that they had to go through Samaria. But I've got a secret for you. They didn't have to go through Samaria. Lots of people made the journey from Judea to Galilee, and they did not go through Samaria. There are lots of other ways to go. It's like saying, in order to get from Ohio to Canada, you have to go through Michigan. No, you don't. You can go other ways. There are roundabout ways to go. But what John is saying here is that Jesus and his disciples, even though they didn't have to go through Samaria, they had to go through Samaria because Jesus made them go through Samaria because Samaria is the world, at least for Jews. It's that world that, you know, the old saying, we should be as Christians in the world, but not of the world. Well, that of the world, that's Samaria there. That's the place that you don't want to be. And so they go through Samaria. Jesus is tired. He finds a well and he sits down and his disciples go off to find some food. So here is Jesus by himself, tired, next to the well of Jacob. Now this is a famous well. And it's famous because of what happens by this well. It's a place of high romance. All of the patriarchs, Isaac, Jacob, they find their wives by the well that becomes Jacob's well. And 
Tradition has it that Moses and Miriam meet at Jacob's well. It's like any time a man and a woman come together at the well, you can tell that something miraculous and romantic is going to happen. And so Jesus sits down at the well and is looking for someone to draw water. And who comes to him but a woman? It's the disciples' worst nightmare, by the way guarantee you. Here they are in Samaria and a woman comes and talks to Jesus. And, and Jesus says to her, I need some water. And she is astonished. She says to him, you, a Jew, are asking me, a woman from Samaria, for water? Imagine yourself in this woman's shoes. Here you are. You're there in the well the heat of the day, maybe because you don't want to see anyone else. No one goes to the well at high noon. It's hot. You go draw water in the morning or at night. But during the day, the only reason you go to the well during the day is because you don't want to see anyone else. But she sees someone else, and it's another man asking her for something and a Jewish man at that. It's like, how many more of these men am I going to have to put up with? And so she says, who are you to ask me for a drink of water? And Jesus says, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water, and I would give it to you. And if you drink my water, you'd never be thirsty again. And something clicks in her mind. She's like, wait, I don't have to come back to this well at high noon anymore. Give me some of this water. She's thinking that there's a spring somewhere. He's talking about living water. Another misunderstanding. Because living water is water that is alive. It springs up out of the ground. It's the difference between that or still water. You know, the, 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 the pond... The retaining ponds in some of your all developments, even though it's got, a, it's got a fountain in it that keeps the water moving so the mosquitoes don't gather, that's not a real spring. That's still water, like the water that's in a well. But living water is that hot spring. It's those, it's those luxurious Roman baths or Turkish baths that we hear so much about. The, the hot springs of Arkansas or other places, right? There may be some of those in Ohio that I'm not aware of. But those are desirable things. Living water, she's like, give me some of that. And he says to her, go and fetch your husband. And now this is where we get a little tricky, folks, because she says to him, I don't have a husband. And he says to her, you're right when you say you don't have a husband because you've had five husbands and the one you're with now isn't your husband. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon on this before or not. You might have heard that somehow this woman with five husbands is somehow her own doing. Look, folks, women in these societies, they don't have the ability to leave their husbands. They've either abandoned her or they've died five times. And if it happens five times, that means that you're the one who's bad luck. You're the one who's cursed. And so Jesus, though, he doesn't dwell on this. Note that. He doesn't belabor the point. And in fact, she tries to change the subject as quickly as she can. She says, hey, I, I can see that you're a prophet, so let me ask you a question. You know, your people, they say that, that the only right place to worship is Jerusalem, but we've been taught that we can worship here on this mountain. See, that's one of the main differences between Jews and Samaritans. Like I told you before, like I told the kids before, they're almost the same. They're almost identical in terms of their beliefs. They both believe that there is a Messiah coming. They both believe in much of what we consider to be our Old Testament. The biggest difference is they don't go to Jerusalem to worship. They have their own high place, their own mountain. Mount Gerizim is where they worship. 
And the Jews, well, because of a long history that we don't really have time to get into today, uh, it has to do with exile and the way that people get repopulated and all these kinds of things. Anyway, there's a lot of animosity. We'll put it that way. So that being said, these, these, these Jews and Samaritans are battling with each other over all of this nonsense, basically. And that's what Jesus says. He says, there's going to come a day when you won't worship in Jerusalem or you won't worship on that mountain because true worship is worship that is spirit and truth. And she says to him, I know the Messiah is coming. And he says to her something he's never said to anyone else. He says, I am. And when Jesus says these words, a little bit later in front of the Sanhedrin, they pick up stones because when you say I am, you are connecting yourself to God because that's God's name. When Moses finds God at the burning bush in Exodus, God reveals himself to Moses and Moses says, but if the people don't believe me and they ask me who you are, what should I say? And he says, I am. It's this four letter Hebrew word that you can't really say. If my kids were here, they would tell you what they think it is. It's this, you know, I mean, it's, it's like breath basically, right? It's this unutterable kind of thing. But Jesus says it. He says, I am He. And then the disciples show up. And they look and they're speechless, right? Because remember what I said before about the romance thing? They're like, oh, golly. Here we go. What's Jesus? What do we have to get him out of now? And while they have their whole side conversation about food and their own misunderstanding, you know, one of my favorite jokes about the disciples is that they're called disciples because they're the duh disciples. <laughs> like they don't get it, duh. So while they're having their own side conversation, this woman, she goes back without her water, by the way. She goes back to the village and she says to everyone there, come and meet a man who told me that everything that I've ever done, could he be the Messiah? She believes before nearly anyone else in John's gospel in who Jesus is. Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And so she gathers a whole bunch of people from her village and brings them back to Jesus. And they hear Jesus and they invite him to stay for two extra days because they want to hear all that Jesus has to say to them too. And when he finally leaves, we hear that Samaria Samaria believes in Jesus as the Messiah the Christ, the son of the living God. And this woman is a hero in the eyes of the people because they brought the reconciling presence of God into their midst. And the promise that all of these old feuds and all of these old ways of doing things might fall away in order that the world might finally have peace. The Samaritans are tired of being treated as second class citizens, as folks who are less than the Jews. And Jesus is the person who comes into their midst and proclaims their worth and proclaims their value. That whether you are a woman who's had five husbands, whether you have 
have the shame and disgrace of having to go to the well at noon, whether you worship on a mountain that is other than the one that is authorized, none of that stuff matters in the eyes of the God who loves the people that God created. These are God's people. Which poses an interesting question for us now, doesn't it? Who are the people that we have written off. Maybe the persons on a singular basis, maybe whole groups of people somewhere who have different beliefs than we do, who worship differently than we do, who have different customs or different strange ways of doing things than we do. Who are the people that God is calling you to love today? You see, the disciples, even though they've had this conversation, it takes them a little while longer to get it. In another one of the Gospels, there is this great story about how the Jesus and his disciples are trying to go through Samaria, but the Samaritans won't let them through. And so the disciples say, Jesus, should we pray to God and call down lightning on them that they might be consumed? No. Duh. Like I said, they're the disciples. But it's a good thing they are. Because these stories are for our benefit. Because we misunderstand. Because we don't get it either. But thanks be to God, we have a Messiah, a Savior, who is as patient with us as he is with them and who proclaims new life in our midst over and over and over and over and over again. And we come back to this well week after week after week, day after day, year after year. But a day is coming, Jesus says, when you won't have to come back to this well anymore. A day when all will worship And John tells us in the Revelation that every knee will bow and every tongue confess on the earth and under it that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. What a great story. What a great story. And the great thing about this story is that we could preach it eight more times or more because every time you come to this well, there's something new. There's some new treasure found in it. But this will be the only time we do it during this series. So, you know, don't worry about getting too repetitive here. But just remember when you hear the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, who John didn't find important enough to give her a name, that her name is child of God, that her name is redeemed, that her name is saved by the one that she first called Messiah. Messiah.